Thanks for that, uh, R.I. Oz, for the invitation to speak and uh, for all of you lovely people turning out. I am always very proud of Adelaide when we participate in these sorts of discussions and we have this deep thinking around, around our future, to be honest. Uh, what is um, we're thinking critically around sustainable energy? It was with some trepidation that I a agreed to be the, uh, the, the lone fossil fuel representative here on the panel. Um, the, um, the title I was given is a synopsis on the, the future of uh, fossil fuel. Now Santos is an upstream which means that we're not in the electricity sector and we're not producing the transport fuels, refining, uh, in the oil and gas industry. So I, I can't I, I speak of with any expertise whatsoever on the coal side of things, but I'll do my best to, uh, to fill in some detail on the gas and why we see gas as, as vital to transitioning the economy to a low carbon economy. And before we can do that, we need to think about probably three key factors, and I'm going to cover these in the presentation. The, we have to consider our region that we're operating in and the unprecedented economic growth and therefore energy demand of the Asia, Asia region, rising CO2 emissions, another key factor. That's part of the reason why we're having this discussion, or the converse of it. How do we lower CO2 emissions and go to that low carbon economy? And, and the third one that we need to look at is the security of supply. Nobody likes it when the lights go out. And how do we make sure that we've got those, manage that transition, as Barry pointed out, but also manage the, the, the security supply for the, the region as well. So if you bear those three in mind, I'm going to uh, endeavour to take us on that journey. First one I'm going to uh, tackle is why is Asia important and why is it important for, for us, particularly in the, uh, the gas industry? Well, there's three key factors that I've got there. If we move from left to right, the first one is nearly 50% of the world's population growth is coming from this region. The second one, GDP. So not only are we increasing the population, but the GDP in that area is increasing. And of course, therefore, the energy supply um, or demands in that area are increasing. What does that mean for our industry? Well, it's interesting because countries such as Malaysia and Indonesia that actually export um, LNG or ex export uh, fossil fuels, they might be getting close to a tipping point where they're needing, instead of exporting into their region, they're going to need to be importing into their region. And from, uh, from our point of view, as an Australian gas company, uh, this is a great opportunity. And I'll talk more about the reserves in terms of uh, what we mean by reserves is the, the gas that we have here in Australia and about the supply for the domestic and the, the Asian market. Why we're ideally placed here is if you look across the globe where the resources are, a lot of the resources are tied up, tied up in what's known as national oil companies or, or national um, hydrocarbon companies, which means they're owned by the, uh, the, the state interests. And Australia, with its geographic pro proximity as well, is ideally positioned to help meet that um, demand growth. And the final thing, we would always say that um, LNG is going to be part of the solution, particularly in the near term, as Barry pointed out, it, the, the lower carbon intensity of, um, of gas versus diesel or coal. So that's the first one. Why is Asia important? The second one is, how do we get to this low carbon future? I've got two very, um, two words I wouldn't have thought I'd see on the same slide, Exxon and Copenhagen or climate change, why they're important for mine is what happened in Copenhagen? Where are we going with climate change policy? Anyone can answer that for me, please. <laughs> I'll give you a job. Um, the, it was inconclusive. We, what we say at Santos, or what I say at Santos, is the carbon price is still a matter of when, not if. We're preparing for that. We acknowledge that, 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 that the world needs to do something on this, on climate change, and that if you, you want to transition, you can't grow economies without electricity and you can't address greenhouse emissions without addressing the role of cleaner fuels. The Copenhagen Accord, the, the, uh, the Bali um, uh, mandate, the roadmap, they're still in negotiation, they'll take a long time, but for us there's a price signal out there and it's going to happen slowly. We've got a constant watch on what's happening here in Australia and we're waiting to see, I think uh, climate change is next week, isn't it? We had, uh, what was it, the first week we had uh, the super tax, this week's refugees, next week's climate change. So I'm looking forward to see how that's resolved. Um, the reason why I put ExxonMobil there, ExxonMobil, high liquids, so the oil side of the gas industry, oil and gas industry, they have taken a bet. 
and as Australians we all like a bit of a punt. They've taken a $40 billion punt, certainly more than I put on my Melbourne Cup horses, um, and they've gone into gas. So even though there's been a lot of press about Copenhagen as a failure, you've got one of the majors making their biggest investment in the last decade away from oil and into gas. So that's carbon. Thirdly, here's my, uh, my advertisement and warning. Why is gas wonderful? Well, lots of people are saying it's wonderful, so it must be. And I'm going to be another one of those. Um, but what we've got there is we've got both sides of politics starting to look at the role of gas. And I've got a quote there from WWF looking at what the role that gas can have in that transition. I'll throw some numbers out here, and I don't have a slide on it, I apologise. But um, if we look at brown coal for electricity generation, it's about 1.2 tonnes of CO2 per megawatt hour. We look at uh, this is existing in Australia. Black coal is a bit more efficient. It's one tonne of CO2 per megawatt hour. Combined cycle gas turbine that we, uh, we were talking about earlier, that's around 0.4 for existing. You can get it to 0.35 with some clever innovations, uh, waste heat recovery and those sorts of things, but let's just use the number 0.4. And that's where we come up with those numbers around that 60% more efficient than coal. The other thing I'll, I'll flag there is, we've done some, some maths there on um, carbon storage. We've looked at geo sequestration, putting CO2 back under the ground as well, and so whether that be for gas or for coal. One of the things, if you take a coal plant and you put the gas back under, the, the, the CO2 under the ground, the number you start to come out with, it, you can get that number, 80% of that number, just by staying with gas as it is. So that's a little convoluted, but basically, 80% of the emissions that you can save from coal, the expense of coal with carbon capture and storage, you already have with gas. So the world's starting to wake up on, on the role of gas and getting us into this transition. What has Australia done? Well, one of the stats that I find is not widely known is how little we have in the economy. Around about 8.6, I've uh, highlighted it there, Australia. Um, it's relatively small uh, compared to, the, to our region. And as I said, I'll draw us back to our region that we're operating in. Though what I can point out is uh, how wonderful our state here in South Australia is, punching above its weight there with 56% gas. And it's not coincidental then that, that um, of the mainland states, SA has the lowest carbon intensity or CO2 profile. Finally, I'm just gonna wrap up quickly here and we can get into the discussion. This is my slide that sort of tries to put everything into the one picture. I mentioned reserves earlier. Currently, we use about one TCF per year of gas. It's slightly under that. We've got reserves in Australia in the order of 250 TCF. We're looking by 2020 that that, and we're looking at that demand growth, that LNG will be exporting around 2.2 TCF and the domestic market around 1.8. So that we're making the point there, of course, that the reserves are there. The clean energy point, I think I've laboured that long enough. But the, what we talk about is Australia's triple bottom line advantage in, in that gas is um, abundant for us here in Australia. We're very lucky. It's affordable and it's available. It's available now. And one of the things that often gets lost in this debate from our point of view is the jobs. At the moment for our LNG plant up in Queensland, Last year, we've been employing almost a person a day on that, that space. So from Santos's point of view, we do support a price on carbon. We think that gas has a role to play in that, but we also think it's just the right thing to do. We have to move the economy on and, and decarbonise the economy. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. So what is, a, what is Santos's primary determinant in whether they choose to export or make domestic use of the gas? If, if they had the choice, complete free reign, what would Santos prefer to do? It's an interesting uh, question because it, it really depends on the policy makeup. Uh, at the moment, if there was a uh, it's supply and demand, um, where the, uh, we've got the supply here in, in um, in Australia and the, the demand for gas, as I said, it's only, it's relatively small. We're hoping to grow that. It's in our best interest as a company to grow that and to have a greater demand in Australia. 
and we're really looking for the uh, policy framework for that. But we're also quite um, uh, bullish about the, the role we can play in Asia and displacing uh, higher carbon intensive fossil fuels. The, um, the 250 trillion cubic feet you cited obviously includes a lot of coal seam gas, which is sort of unconventional yeah. natural gas. How do you think exploiting those resources is going to change the gas price and what will that do to electricity prices if we depend more on gas? Well, on the first question, I didn't really introduce what coal seam gas was. From our point of view and from a, a simple non-geologist's point of view, basically it's the same gas. It's still methane, molecules of methane that we're, we're um, using as an energy source, but it's coming from a coal seam rather than a, a sandstone, for example, a sedimentary reservoir rock. In terms of what that will do to the price, uh, what has happened is that um, it's doubled Australia's resources, uh, or probably more than in terms of reserves, by uh, identifying this additional resource with the, the coal seam gas. What it will do to price will, de will um, depend again on those, those, same, those same supply factors. The price in the Australian electricity market is really driven by coal at this stage. Gas is such a small um, a margin there that it, it's not going to affect that. Obviously, as a company, we're going to look to see um, which, which, um, which markets are, are, are available. And at the moment, we're looking at both. We're looking at a domestic and an international market. OK, given that coal is so cheap and abundant, what would the carbon price have to be to make gas, say combined cycle gas turbines, the most um, cost effective way of generating electricity? The, the cost that people start to talk around uh, from a carbon price is quoted to between $25 and $35 a tonne. And you'll start to tip over from uh, coal to gas. And they're, they're not necessarily our numbers. They're widely quoted by uh, Frontier Economics, MMA, all the, the everyone who wants to have a, uh, have a, a carbon model there. But around that price, because of the carbon intensity of coal, that will tip it in favour of gas. And with the renewable energy target, uh, wind will be the cheapest, and, and then, then gas, and then, then coal, with a, with a price around that range. Given that gas is such an incredibly useful product for things such as chemical feedstocks, potentially transportation fuel, don't you think it's a waste to be burning it in power stations for electricity generation when we have other options? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone should go home and turn on their gas stove. <laughs> no. Uh, the, um, uh, it, 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 I think, again, it, what we need to do when, if I take off my Santos hat and think about how we're going to uh, supply energy to our country and so forth, one of the things we need to look at is what that energy infrastructure looks like. Do we go to um, become more and more efficient at, at generating electricity and go to electric vehicles, put everything onto electric, plug it all in? Um, and then do we look at what the makeup of that fuel um, mix is, whether that be coal, diesel, gas, renewables, uh, and then you can start to look at what the cost is, and you're going to put economics in there, but in the tricky thing, and the thing we're all grappling with at the moment in terms of policy and with our vote, is how do you price in or how do you factor in the environmental impacts, whether that be water, whether it be um, uh, particulate matter, SOX and NOx, or whether that be carbon dioxide. Can I ask a question? Mm. You're saying that we're using one TCF for you? Yes. And the reserves is 250. Yes. And it's only 8% of what we need in terms of energy. And that uh, mm. natural gas is only 8% of energy generation. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So on the take, East Coast. If we yeah. take your scenario yes. and use only natural gas for energy generation, so mm. we need roughly 12 TCF a year, which means it's only going to last us 12 years. Yeah, uh, what do we do after that? <laughs> uh, well, I didn't propose that we only use gas uh, in the first instance. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but 8% uh, eight, eight is pretty low. Um, you can push that number up. There's 250 proven at the moment, uh, uh, TCF of gas. But we don't see that gas would be the only thing. I mean, that would be naive. One of the things that we, we, we see and we've um, certainly supported is partnership with renewable. Um, you, ne you need the, the peaking plant for when it's not windy or to, to flatten out the, those spikes there in the electricity demand curve? I, I support gas, but uh, uh, because it is efficient. Or, uh, no, it's also uh, pollutless, but um, uh, if you want to build infrastructure, it's going to be a long term. Mm. 
the other thing that you, you need to look at, and we've, it's it's a good point, and it, it's good to pick it, pick it apart, but it, it's quite simple maths that we're comparing the one TCF that we're currently using now in Australia, based on the plants that are in existence, to ramp up, we'd have to go to new plant, and as you ramp up, you start to get, you have more efficient. So the open cycle is less efficient, so you're using more gas to get the same amount of power, as you know. And one of the things I always find as an, a bit of an analogy that's interesting is we need to meet our energy demand and we've got our supply there. So we can either get more supply or we can reduce demand. And the analogy there is it's sort of like um, filling up a sink without the plug-in. You can turn the tap on harder and you can, you can start to fill up the sink, but God, it makes a lot of sense to put in a plug there and try and find ways to reduce that demand side. That's an interesting point you raise about the open cycle, that you know, if, if we're going to build lots of wind, what would we be building in terms of gas? It'd be open cycle. Yeah, absolutely. You'll have to build um, peaking plants. And, yeah. and yet, if you wanted to be most efficient with your gas, what would you build? Yeah, a combined cycle. Yeah. Mm, so it's an interesting dilemma yeah. which we'll explore in the next, in the next of the series.